Okay, you guys, welcome back. Um, so we're getting down to the wire. This is going to be your second to last lecture of the year. All right. And it's uh, the first part of Chapter 24, Solid and Hazardous Waste. The reading you ought to do to accompany this lecture is pages 557 through 569. All right, and we're going to jump right in. Solid waste. So we are talking about the stuff that either goes in your trash can or into your cycle bin. Or if you guys have a composter or like a green waste container at your house, depending on whether your parents pay for that or not, uh, that's stuff we're talking about. Okay, and on average, to get you the stuff that you consume, your food uh, and other materials, you personally, on average, probably generate around 2.1 kilograms per day. Obviously, that's going to vary person to person, so this would be an average value. All right. Um, and when we talk about solid waste, we, there's two main types. There's municipal, municipalities referring to your household. So again, uh, stuff that goes out in your trash can, recycle bin, or composter. And then uh, non-municipal solid waste, which is also a, an important component, which would be generated by industry, agriculture, mining, hospitals, etc. Okay? Um, now, so if you go, if you were to dig through the, the items in an average households, solid waste, I don't know why you would actually do that, but if you were to, on average, paper and paperboard would make up about 34.2% of that, yard waste 13.1%, plastics, food waste, etc. All right, so the thing to consider here, most of you guys have been around long enough to know more or less the items that are recyclable. Now, I know not all types of plastic are recyclable, for example, but let's take a look at your municipal solid waste stream. All right, and this is by volume, by the way. What portion of your solid waste do you think is recyclable? Well, paper and paperboard, almost across the board is. Most plastics are. Metals certainly are. Glass is in certain areas, although not in Walla Walla, all right? So that's a relatively large portion of your waste stream that could be diverted away from a landfill, for example. Now, on top of that, most of your yard waste and a lot of your food waste could uh, be composted, um, including wood, for example, although you'd have to have some sort of wood chipper for that, all right? Uh, again, adding to that portion of your waste that could be diverted from landfills. So really what we're left with is rubber, leather, and textiles, okay, and then other. Now, of course, some of those plastics, some of the paper, some of the food waste probably needs to go to a landfill as opposed to a compost facility, really depending on the compost facility that is. All right, so uh, that's an important note. All right, so if you guys run uh, recycling, the curbside recycling at your house, so if you're in the city of Wall Wall, for example, you probably ought to be generating a higher volume of recyclable material than you are household waste. So just something to think about. Um, so when we dispose of solid waste, all right, um, in general, 54.3% of that waste goes to landfills. Okay, about 13.6% is incinerated. And again, that really depends on uh, what your area does with the solid waste. And then about a third of it gets recycled. Now think back though, this number right here should actually be the smallest portion of our waste. The bulk of it should either be composted or recycled, or in some cases even reused before the recycled, right? So obviously a lot of recycled material and compostable material ends up going to landfills or to incinerators, okay? Uh, so despite the fact that we could be recycling and composting a lot of our household waste, the fact is we don't. All right, so when we say a sanitary landfill, what do we actually mean by that? So um, the, the landfill out where, so where your garbage goes, so if you, uh, the, we're talking about the stuff that goes into the trash can, that all gets taken to the Sudbury landfill. So it's all off Sudbury Road, all right? And it is a sanitary landfill. And the way that works is um, before they take a section and actually begin throwing the, the solid waste in it, um, it needs to be properly prepared and in the preparation of that landfill, all right? One of the most important things, if not the most important, is a way to make sure 
that we are not contaminating ground or surface water. So as you can imagine, the water that percolates down through a landfill, okay, uh, picks up a lot of material, right? And that material is called leachate, by the way, L-E-A. Let me write that where you can see it, L-E-A-C-H-A-T-E. -E. All right, so the water that percolates through a sanitary landfill uh, pick, dissolves and picks up all kinds of nastiness, right? And the water that does so is called a leachate. Sanitary landfills are designed to collect that leachate. So that leachate doesn't just percolate down into the ground and eventually get into your well water and poison people, right? That water is collected and treated, okay, uh, to make it much cleaner before it's allowed to go out into nature, all right? Um, so we have water collection, some sort of method for that, okay? And then um, we have what's called uh, lining, right? So they take some sort of really durable uh, rubber and plastic and clay to make an impermeable barrier so that as water percolates through, right, it is essentially channeled out, uh, not into soil, but directly to that water collection, right? So again, we're talking layers of clay and plastic and rubber uh, specially sealed and lined so the water that percolates through has an impermeable barrier and then gets channeled to your leachate collection system. All right, so uh, that is a sanitary landfill. That's how it works. All right, and then as we begin to fill that area, right, uh, trucks come and drop it off and we have big bulldozers and compaction facilities to pack that trash down so we can compact as much as we possibly can into that landfill. All right. Um, and most of the solid waste in the U.S. does go to sanitary landfills. It's the most common method of disposal. All right. Um, so some of the environmental problems associated with landfills. Okay. Even uh, our most, our best installed landfills do produce methane. So methane gas, uh, if you recall, is a byproduct of anaerobic decomposition. So there's bacteria that is slowly uh, decomposing that solid waste, right? Now, because it's so compact, um, there's very little oxygen available. So we get anaerobic decomposition, all right? Um, and during that anaerobic decomposition, we produce methane. Now, methane... Um, like carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, although it is much more potent and it's a little bit more volatile. Um, for example, it could be a contributor to photochemical smog. I think it's a hydrocarbon. All right. Now, even though we do our best to properly install and line our landfills, there still is potential for contamination of both surface and groundwater. Um, and we have to remember that even though things de decompose, they decompose much more slowly than we fill them up. And so uh, it's not a long-term remedy to solid waste, right? Eventually, the Sudbury landfill is going to fill up, and we're going to have to try to find a new site for our garbage. All right? Um, now, it's very difficult to find a suitable location for solid waste, right? Lots of people... Um, maybe live in rural areas, which is where the waste is likely to end up, are going to have that NIMBY response, right? They know that the landfills are needed, but not in their backyard, right? They don't want a landfill near their house, okay? Um, and in terms of uh, overall costs, uh, you know, operating a landfill isn't super expensive, but closing it uh, and making it ready for to be uh, useful again is an expensive venture. Uh, in fact, I don't know if many of you know, but out by the, uh, the Mill Creek Sportsplex, um, out in, in that area between, uh, uh, by the Mill Creek Sportsplex is where the old landfill used to be. Okay. And right now there's just kind of grasses and shrubs growing on top of it. It's not really used for anything, but there is a proposal. And I'm not sure how far down that path they've gone yet to put a bunch of solar panels on top of it, which I think is pretty cool. So they're taking land that can't be used for building, for example, or for agriculture um, and trying to make some sort of productive use out of it other than simply just growing grass. All right. Um, so what types of materials do, do pose special problems for landfills? Plastic is one of them. Now we did 
already uh, discussed plastic in some detail back in our water pollution unit, right? But uh, plastic, as you should all know, is not decomposable. So nature does not have a good way of breaking that down back into uh, carbon dioxide and uh, other components, for example. It just breaks it into smaller and smaller pieces of plastic, right? Uh, plastic is low density and buoyant, so it tends to work its way to the top where it can be blown away by wind or carried away by water and end up in our streams and break down and cause all those problems we learned about back in the water pollution unit. All right. Uh, tires <clears throat> pose a special problem. Now, the reason tires are a problem uh, is not so much that they're toxic. So they're very similar to plastic in that we, the nature does not have a good way of breaking it down. Right. Um, and so plastic, which could potentially be diverted from the landfill and melted down and just made into an, a different plastic container. Tires do not have that ability. We can't melt the tires um, and reuse them like we could plastic. All right. Um, and so what we end up with is these huge uh, repositories for tires where the tires just kind of sit there right, and take up space. They take up a large volume. Um, and it's difficult to reuse the tires in productive ways. You know, some people use them in their gardens for growing potatoes as a container, right? Uh, they, some of them are shredded and made into like playground equipment and, or into tracks and stuff like that. But those uses are not enough to make up for how many tires we actually go through. Okay. Um, now, once the tires sit in these big piles, I mean, they're relatively inert. They're not toxic per se. They're not really causing problems. Um, the only issue is they really take up space. And um, because of the nature of tires, inside those little rings uh, of the tire is a uh, space where water can collect. And where you got standing water, we could end up with kind of a mosquito issue, right, which could increase the the occurrence of some diseases that mosquitoes carry. Really, that's the only major problem. You know, they could attract vermin like rats, kind of make nest sites for rats, I suppose, too. But the tires themselves are relatively benign. Okay? Now, um, so what to do with these tires? Obviously, the long-term solution is not to let them just keep piling up. We need to try to make some use out of them. They could be incinerated, right? So we could use them... Uh, burn them to reduce the volume. Although I believe you've seen the types of smoke and stuff that comes from burning tires when people peel out on the roads. Uh, so we run into a big air quality issue with tire incineration. All right. So um, recycling, reusing tires. Now, technically, we're not recycling tires. We're essentially reusing the materials for a different purpose. All right. Um, so we can make playground equipment out of tires, right? So the rubberized uh, kind of undercoating to make the, the playground area soft and spongy. We use tires for that. Uh, we can make trash cans out of them. We can make them into garden hoses. Uh, some of the material could be used for the underlayment of carpet. And we can use it for roofing materials. Um, it's very good at repelling water. All right. Um, and so as of right now, we can, these other u potential uses for tires, uh, is enough to account for about 36%. So we still have two thirds of the tires that are not being reused or put to another purpose. All right. So, uh, if the solid waste that's not being recycled or composted or put into a landfill, then the only other option really to do with it is incineration. Now, um, couple things about incineration. So first of all, what incineration does is it reduces the volume of waste by about 90%. So we do still end up with some ash, and that ash uh, tends to be highly concentrated in some nasty stuff, uh, but we get about 10% of the volume of our trash, right? And so uh, incineration would obviously increase the lifetime of our landfill. So after incineration, the ash does need to be disposed of in a sanitary landfill probably actually a hazardous waste site, uh, which is part of a normal sanitary landfill. Okay, but we have greatly reduced the volume. Now, the other thing we can do with it is since we're burning it and generating lots of heat, we might as well make the best use of that heat possible, which would likely be uh, electricity generation. So that's what they call waste to energy. Now you could use the heat for heating buildings and other purposes, but the most likely uh, thing to do with it is to produce electricity. All right. Now, 
It's burning garbage for electricity. There's, there's poetry in that, in my opinion. Um, now, we, we also have some air quality concerns that accompany that. But if you compare the amount of carbon produced from burning waste to using things like coal, oil, or even our cleanest burner, natural gas, the carbon footprint, uh, while still significant, is less than any of the fossil fuels. So per kilowatt hour, um, we produce less carbon from household waste than we do from things like natural gas, oil, and coal. Um, and so in the whole climate change discussion, trying to reduce the amount of carbon, um, that that's a viable option. Not to mention the fact that by diverting waste from a landfill, we avoid methane production, right? And methane, of course, is a much more potent uh, uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. So um, it seems like a very viable option were it not for the sort of uh, uh, air pollution uh, issues, right? So if you're burning trash, you can imagine the, the types of pollutants that could potentially be escaping the atmosphere, especially if we're not careful to pull out uh, things like plastics that produce uh, dioxins, things like uh, that might contain lead or mercury that can create uh, all kinds of nastiness in our air. So we have some huge pollution controls. Now, we do have technology in place to make the exhaust from our incineration plants relatively clean. All right? They're just expensive. Okay? Now, uh, we do still produce large amounts of ash, but again, that volume of the ash compared to just normal la uh, landfill setting is about 90% less. Okay? Um, but... Also, like a sanitary landfill, the site selection for an incineration plant is controversial. No one really wants garbage burning in their backyard, right? Uh, probably not because it smells too good. All right. Now, um, we will talk more about recycling in a, in a later discussion, but composting um, is an important thing. And the types of things we can compost be uh, food scraps, sewage sludge, the solid waste from sewage. Uh, agricultural manure, and then of course your yard waste, so your grass clippings and uh, leaf litter from the fall, right? Food scraps, uh, actually technically all of your food scraps are compostable, but not all facilities will take uh, things that contain like fats or oils, okay? Because uh, to can accompany those. Sewage sludge after being properly treated can be composted, um, as can agricultural manure. Okay, um, and the benefits of composting, of course, it's going to reduce the volume of waste that goes to landfills, right? Um, it could potentially be sold or distributed to the community um, because the compost itself is great for soil, so people with gardens. Or you can spread compost on your yard to help your grass grow better rather than using synthetic fertilizers. Um, well, composting is a great option, and it's actually really easy and Low technology. We have been composting for thousands of years. All right. Uh, all it requires is a place to put it and bacteria. And that's it. Pretty low maintenance, low technology method to reduce the volume of household waste. All right. Uh, that concludes this discussion. We will talk about recycling uh, specifically along with hazardous wastes uh, more next time.